okay? I also don't like the lack of control with these types of qualified retirement accounts. Most people don't know this, but like you don't really own your 401k, your employer does. They say what you can and can invest in. I don't like that, that's just me. So the, the next type of account, something called a self-directed account. Same exact things as these, we're just adding the word self-directed, right? Adding those two words, self-directed retirement accounts, simply give you more control and ownership over what you invest in. The type of things that we invest in, in these accounts, this is where the strategy comes in. Most people have no strategy with their 401k. It's just whatever the employer said, and then you just, you dump money in and you hope and pray for an average rate of return. When you self-direct, there's more control, there's more ownership, there's more accountability on, on yourself, more responsibility. I like that. I like more responsibility when it comes to my money. I like more control when it comes to my money. I like more ownership. I like the ability to be a better steward with my money if I have more control. The more control I have, the more dominion, the more authority I'll have over that thing. The less I have, the less influential I can be over that particular product. So with the self-directed account, you could invest in more things. And in a 401k, you wouldn't be able to. Okay. So that's a different type of account. And then you get to measure. So, okay, do I like that more? So you get to put your opinions. I gave you the facts, right? I gave you my opinions and you get to combine those things together and then figure out, okay, well now who do I go to find these self-directed accounts? And that's where we get to do our own due diligence and, and find people. You can message me directly and then I can do research with you and show you some options, right? Or you can be like, Hey, I found this person. What do you think? And then we can do research together and figure out that next step. So self-directed. Then you have the uh, Roth IRA, which is another type of retirement account. But unlike qualified retirement accounts that provide a deduction, the contributions you make initially with the IRA, with the Roth IRA, you don't get a deduction up front. This is post-tax dollars going in to the Roth IRA, and then it grows tax-free. As of right now, you can contribute up to $7,000 into a Roth IRA. A Roth IRA can also be um, self-directed if I'm not mistaken. You can have a self-directed Roth if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong on that or, or maybe it's just a regular Roth. I have a Roth with um, Fidelity, right? Once you reach a certain amount of income, you're no longer able to contribute to a Roth, but then there's a strategy that exist. This is a fact, something called a backdoor, essentially where you have a qualified retirement account and then you uh, roll over the funds into a Roth. You still pay the taxes. You're just, you're just now able to get more, you're able to get more dollars into the Roth IRA and have that money grow tax-free. Um, and there's tax-free distribution, right? So it grows tax-free or tax deferred, and then you're able to withdraw tax-free. Here's an opinion. Me personally, when it comes to my financial strategy, I want as much of my money later on in life to be tax-free. I want as much of my money to be as tax-free as humanly possible because I don't know what the taxes will be in the future. But if I have tax-free jurisdiction over this money, tax-free authority over this money, tax-free authority over this money, I don't have to worry about what taxes will be then. So that's just an opinion. It's my personal strategy. That's what I'm doing. So therefore, for now, I do have a Roth IRA. Over time, I will practice the backdoor Roth as of right now. Works uh, with, with a Roth IRA, lesser fees and costs, depending on what you invest in. You know, if you invest in mutual funds, there'll be, you know, different fees and stuff like that. But, um, and if you are managing the Roth IRA yourself and not someone else, you also reduce in fees. Because right, you're not paying someone to invest that for you, you're kind of doing it yourself. Next thing, you have an HSA, health savings account. In order to qualify, you have to have a certain type of health insurance that is HSA eligible. Okay, and that usually means high deductible, uh, higher premium in order to get the HSA. Me personally, I pay for a health insurance plan that only costs me $200 a month. That's what I, and it's, and it's HSA eligible. And so what I do is I contribute the max. Each year, I've been I've been funding an HSA for I want to say four years now, maybe five. And the money grows tax deferred, and the money has the potential to be tax free, and it's definitely tax free on medical expenses. So this goes into okay, well here's a unique strategy where instead of having all my money in one location, how most of us are taught, right? We're we're, we're taught invest 15% of our income into what? Boom, your 401k 
your retirement account up to the match. And then people save money in a savings account or CD bond money market, and then they'll have their social security and their pension. Hopefully that's enough. Well, I'm seeing more and more and more that when I meet people 59 and a half and up, it's just simply not enough money. They did everything right, but it's simply not enough money. It's because of how they're distributing their wealth, sequence of return. They're getting that totally messed up. So if we had the same $2 million, but it was spread out over a multitude of different accounts, one could make the argument that that person is way more secure and guaranteeing their retirement, that they won't run out of money, the money will outlive them, and they'll have stuff to pass on. Same $2 million. Like, how can that be? If they both withdraw the same amount of income each and every year, how can that be? Has to do with fees and sequencing of returns as well is how they're so for me i know that my health will deteriorate no matter what because we're mortal beings all of us will die there's only one person in record that has the status of coming back to life after dying for a prolonged period of time right there's people that died for two minutes and came back to life Sure, but there's only one person that died for three days, right? And then came came back. Other than that, there's no one else on record that has that that flex, right? That has that status. No, no one else that I know of. You know someone, let me know. But until then, I know my health will deteriorate. I know that cost of medical expenses will increase because my health will deteriorate. It's gonna cost more money to keep me alive and keep me healthy when I'm in my 80s, 90s. There's just gonna be things that are gonna that are gonna come up. I knowing this, instead of me throwing majority of my money in this high potential ROI location with fees and all these different things, I'm gonna take a portion of that. I'm gonna stick it over here in this HSA, a portion, 4,150. By the way, this number increases every year. From what I've seen, usually increases by like $100 or $50. This year, it increased quite a bit from the previous year. It was like at 38 something. Same thing with the Roth IRA. It was at $6,500. They bumped it up to 7,000. So that number also tends to in increase slightly. So, so it has these max contributions. Qualified retirement accounts also have max contributions, but they're much higher, right? Much higher. So HSA, tax deferred. Also, you get the deduction off today. So that 4,150, I can write that off my taxable income that year. And that 4,150 can be invested tax deferred. Then when I reach 59 and a half, just like the other qualified retirement accounts, I can withdraw the money tax free. So let's say I need 10,000 a month and let's say I'm averaging say 6,000 a year in medical expenses. Let's say that's 500 bucks a month. Instead of pulling the full 10, my qualified retirement account, I could actually less for that for that year, right? By by $500. So now I'm only pulling out $9,500. Because when I pull out the 10, does it cost more money to withdraw 10,000 out of this retirement account versus 9,500 here and 500 bucks here? Let me see some comments. Which which will cost me more? I'm pulling out the same dollar amount, 10,000. 95 here, 500 here, or just a full 10 here. Which will cost me more money? Me pulling out in two locations or me pulling out in one location? I'll well, make sure you're still with me. Who's with me? Who's with me? More expensive. 401k would cost more, I would think. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone else? Kim says 401k. So we're all in agreement. Cool. But let's let's prove it now. Thea says 401k would cost more. Okay. Let's prove that. If I pull out 10000 I have to still pay in this account. And because I pulled $500 more out of here, I had to sell, uh, you know, more stock, let's say. So I now have less money compounding in that account because I pulled the full 10. That extra $500 difference there, I'm paying a higher tax on, on the withdrawal on my income. That alone, you tally all that up, it's more than tax-free. That's about simple as it gets. $500 is tax-free. So the, so the net, even though I pulled out the same dollar amount, I'm only paying taxes on the 95. The other guy is paying taxes on 10. I pulled out only what I needed from here. Mind you, the account's been growing tax-free, tax-deferred, just like this one. And now, tax-free withdrawal. So I don't have to pull out as much money. I can just pull out exactly what I need to cover my medical expenses on a monthly basis or whenever they, whenever I go to the doctor. Maybe I only go to the doctor four to six times a year in my 
you know, late sixties or, or seventies or whatever it is. Um, and whatever prescriptions I'm on or whatever I'm, I might, I may or may not be taking. I, I don't, I, I, with this, what's really cool is you get a debit card with these types of HSA accounts. Some of them, not all of them, but, uh, one, uh, one I had in the past, you, you get a debit card. So you literally like swipe it right there on the spot. That's pretty cool. So you can have some money in your HSA like cash, right? And then you can have a portion of it invested, right? And so you're able to return that money that you grew over time in a, in a particular sequence into paying less in cost and fees. So many people undervalue cost, fees, and taxes. We're just looking at one metric. So in this community, my goal is to teach everyone to look at multiple metrics of how we make our decisions with these types of accounts. Okay, so we're just going through what these do, how these actually benefit you. And we're just looking at the core of it. Once we look at the core, then we can look at a strategy that gets attached to the particular product. In the case of the HSA, it gave you the facts, tax deferred, tax deduction, tax free withdrawal on medical expenses. Here's a strategy that some people will do. When they have medical expenses prior to 59 and a half, they don't spend it from here. They, they keep spending it out of pocket in their expenses. They then track the expenses of qualified medical expenses. There's a template that you can download and you can just Google it, qualified medical expenses on your HSA, right? It gives you a whole list, all kinds of things that you'd be like, what? So you track all that. Let's say you spend, I'm 28 years old. Let's say from 28 to 59 and a half, I spend $150,000 on medical expenses, qualified medical expenses expenses the whole time, <clears throat> 28 to 59 and a half. And in my case, it would be like 24 to 59 and a half, 150 grand. Let's say there might be four or 500,000 built up in there, right? Through, through investments long, long term. As long as I kept good record, I can claim deduction on all those qualified medical expenses as a reimbursement tax-free income to myself year over year up to that number if you were to do that because there is no um, expiration date on when you can claim your deductions on on medical expenses you can just save save the receipts save the receipts I'm, I'm doing that now so let's say you did that with me here's where the strategies Here's, here are our opinions. This is an opinion of, of what I'm doing, but it's a strategy and it, and it proves to have, so if I need 10,000 a month and I've got $150,000 of tax-free income built up in this account here, you say, okay, um, if I want 150 to last 30 years, five grand, so I could pull out an extra $400. I could pull out an extra, like we just run the math. Okay, uh, 150 grand, we can make it shorter. I'd buy 15 years, divide by 12, all right, 10,000, divide by 12, 833. So I could pull out, let's just say an extra $800. 1,300 coming out of the HSA. If I need 10,000 to live off of, minus 1,300. Now how much am I pulling out of here? $8,700 out of my Qualify retirement account. Who pays less? Person that pulls out 10K. The person that pulls out 87 here and 1300 here because that's 1300 net covers certain bills and expenses. This keeps going, right? So that's a strategy on top of two financial products. Then it's just a matter of, well, how do I figure out the timing makes sense for me to start contributing to an HSA, let's say, or qualify retirement account or self-directed Roth IRA, right? And we haven't even gone through the rest yet. When does it make sense? I think this is where we need counseling because this simple answer from a financial uh, a perspective, a financial influencer, coach, right? The simple answer for me to say is as soon as possible. The earlier, the better. It's easy to say, right?